Hello and welcome to Daily Current Affairs by Neo IS. Today is 23rd August 2019 and the topics for discussion are Financial Action Task Force, FIDOR, Angel Tax, Rice Fortification Pilot Scheme, MAP Aided Program and Previous Year Question Revision Series. Now coming to our first topic which is the Financial Action Task Force. Now this is in news because uh, Pakistan has been placed in the lowest rung or the blacklist of the Financial Action Task Force. Okay, now we'll talk about this news. Now Pakistan, uh, after being placed, this has been placed by the FATF Asia Pacific Group. You know, and they placed uh, Pakistan in the blacklist because of non-compliance and non-enforcement of safeguards against terror financing and money laundering. Now the Asia Pacific Group uh, placed Pakistan on the enhanced expedite follow-up list. That is what you call the blacklist. Uh, uh, they put them there because of the reasons uh, given above. Now placing of Pakistan on the lowest rung does not bring any punitive measures but the country will have to send quarterly report uh, safeguards against terror financing. Here what they are saying is that uh, just because Pakistan has been placed in the lowest region that is the blacklist, there is not going to be any more stringent punishments on them. But the number of times that Pakistan, uh, the frequency with which the Pakistan has to go back to FATF and show that their measures will increase. So this is what FATF actually has done for Pakistan. Now uh, we'll talk about what happens uh, when in the you know Asia Pacific Group meeting. Now the APG is one of the nine uh, regional affiliates of the FATF and it met in Canberra from August 18 to 23 in 2019 and they met uh, to discuss a five year review of the mutual evaluation report for Pakistan and uh, decided to place it among the countries required for enhanced expedited follow up. Now according to the APG's final report, Pakistan failed in 32 out of 40 compliance parameters and 10 out of 11 effectiveness parameters. So this is where Pakistan has utterly failed in all the ways it can, uh, measures it, it can take to safeguard against terror financing. Okay, now as a result Pakistan is likely to be placed on the lowest which is the fourth uh, rung in the FATF's ranking list. This is what is called as the blacklist. At present, uh, Pakistan is in the grey list of the FATF. Uh, it's a common group for countries that, is, that are termed as high risk and non-cooperative jurisdictions. This is where F, uh, Pakistan is present as of now. But after this meeting, most probably Pakistan will be put in the blacklist. After pressure from uh, US, France, Germany, UK and countries like that, Pakistan was earlier grey listed by the FATF. Now we will come to the next topic which is FIDOR. It's in news because Russia has launched an unmanned rocket into space. Okay, now this rocket is carrying a life-sized human robot that will spend 10 days learning uh, to assist astronauts on the International Space Station. Now FIDOR here stands for Final Experimental Demonstration Object Research. That is what FIDOR stands for. And it is also called as a Skybot F850 and this robot is the first one sent by Russia. Now Fedor copies human movements and this human movements is why it is very very important or this a very unique skill which can help uh, astronauts on the ISS to do maintenance work on the ISS or can be remotely accessed from earth. Now Fedor is described as a potentially useful on earth for working in high radiation environments that is the uh, reason here. You know uh, usually if, for example if you take in the international space station as it is floating on space right it comes under the contact of high level of solar radiations. Now if a astronaut actually has to go outside of the capsule to do some maintenance work on the International Space Station, they are under the effects of the solar radiations which is harmful for the body. Even though they are wearing astronaut suits, there is only some percentage of which can be blocked by the astronaut suit and some percentage actually passes through them and actually ends up hitting the body or passing through the body of the astronaut. But if you have a robot like this, like Fedor, it can stop, you know, it can actually be an advantage for the astronaut so that their health is maintained in the extreme radiation environments. Now this is an additional uh, area here, Fedor is not the first robot to go in space, okay. This is the first one to be sent by Russia, but not the first one in the world. In 2011, NASA, that is of USA, NASA sent up 
Robonaut 2, a humanoid robot developed with General Motors and similar aim of working in high-risk environments. It was flown back to Earth in 2018 after experiencing technical problems. That was in 2011 and in 2013, Japan sent up a small robot called Kirobo along with the ISS first Japanese space commander. Okay, Now the Kirobo was developed with to uh, Toyota and it was able to hold conversations only in Japanese. That was the problem with Kirobo. Now coming to the next topic which is angel tax. This is in news because the finance minister Nirmala Sitaraman has provided the much needed relief for startups. Uh, community by announcing that angel tax will not be applicable on entities registered with the Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, that is DIPT. Okay, now we'll give a little bit of background. Angel tax was uh, introduced in 2012 budget by the then finance minister, which was who was uh, Pranam Mukherjee, to arrest laundering of funds. Now, the misuse of incentives given to the startups was the main factor that tempted the government to impose tax on fresh investment over fresh, fair price shares. Now, we will talk about what is angel tax. Now, angel tax is an income tax payable on capital raised by unlisted companies from investors. Okay, now these investors are basically angel investors. Now, this is done via issue of shares if the sold share price is excess of the fair market value. Okay, I hope you understand if there is a commodity and uh, it is being sold much more over the fair market price value, those uh, tax on that amount is what you call angel tax. Now the excess of share price over the fair market price and the amount of raised is treated as an income and taxed accordingly. The tax was applicable on angel investments that are supposed to make investment startups, hence it is known as angel tax. Now, who is an angel investor? An angel investor is an affluent individual who pr provides capital for a business startup, usually in exchange for convertible debt or ownership entity. It is also known as business angel, informal investor, angel funder, private investor or seed investor. Now, why is angel tax problematic? There are no definite way to measure the fair market value of any startup. Now, investors pay a premium for the idea and the business potential at the angel funding stage. However, tax officials seem to be assessing the value of the startup based on the net asset value at one point. This is why it's a problem. Now, coming to uh, the next topic which is Rice Fortification Pilot Scheme. Now, this is news because the Vice Chairman of Niti Ayo, that is Sri Rajiv Kumar, discussed the implementation of rice fortification pilot scheme with Union Minister of Consumer Affairs, uh, that is Sri Ram Vilas Paswan. Now we'll talk about the rice fortification pilot scheme. This is a centrally sponsored pilot scheme on fortification of rice and its dispersal through public distribution system, PDS. Now this has been approved by the government. Now fortification is a complementary strategy to fight malnutrition under which the addition of key vitamins and minerals such as iron, iodine, zinc, vitamins A and D to staple foods such as rice, wheat, oil, milk and salt are done to improve the nutritional content. Now, Financial assistance of up to 90% is there in the case of northeastern and uh, hilly states and island states also and up to 75% in case of rest of the states. Now further the government of India has also advised all states and union territories, especially those states and union ter territories which are distributing wheat flour through PDS, to distribute fortified wheat flour through PDS. So, But what the government is actually saying is, those uh, PDS system which are actually distributing wheat, wheat flour, that is ATA uh, from their uh, PDS system, PDS shops, they should actually replace the ATA which is there to fortified ATA so that the extra vitamins and minerals are present in the food. Now the recommended dietary allowance for Indian population is finalized by the National Institute of Nutrition Indian Council of Medical Research. Now this is based on the recommendations of the expert group. Now we will talk about biofortification. Biofortification is a process by which the nutritional quality of food crops is improved through agronomic practices. Okay, conventional plant breeding or modern biotechnology. It differs from conventional fortification in that biofortification aims to increase nutrient level in crops during plant growth rather than 
uh, through manual means during processing of the crops. Here the difference between uh, food fortification and bio fortification is that in food fortification addition of uh, minerals and vitamins are done after the harvest during the processing of the food while in bio fortification new nutrients and minerals are added uh, into the food grains or any other food while the plant itself is growing. So that is where the stage at which uh, new added minerals are, uh, and vitamins are added into the crop that is where it differs between uh, fortification and bio fortification. Now regulation of the fortification now it is done by the FSC, FSSAI has formulated a comprehensive regulation on fortification of foods namely FA Food Safety and Standards Fortification of Foods Regulations of 2016. These regulations set the standards for food fortification and encourage the production, manufacture and distribution sale on consumption of the fortified foods. Now the Food Fortification Resource Center is uh, established by the FSSAI in collaboration with the Tata Trust. Now coming to the map aided program, today we will be talking about the Shakskam Valley. Now Shakskam Valley as you can see here in this picture you see the picture of Jammu and Kashmir. You see the red region there which is the Gilgit Bathistan uh, which is actually a part of Kashmir that is of Indian Kashmir but as of now it is occupied by the Pakistanis and uh, it is as of now under the uh, control of the Pakistan administration. Now above the red region you can actually see a brown strip. Okay. Now this region is what you call as the Shakskam Valley. This uh, and below the Shakskam Valley, you can see a yellow triangular region that is the Siachen Glacier. Okay, so now the speciality about Shakskam uh, Valley is that it is also called the Trans Karakoram Tract. Okay, it is lying on top on the north of the Karakoram Range. Now, uh, as you know, this uh, Shakskam Valley or the Trans Karakoram Tract actually used to be uh, under the control of the Pakistani administration under Pakistan after the whole entire war of 1948 and after India had to follow the cease fire order given by the United Nations, India only could capture you know two thirds of the region of Jammu and Kashmir but could not follow up all the way through. That was what happened uh, with respect to India in 1948 and Pakistan on the other hand had one third control over the rest of Jammu and Kashmir. Now what the Pakistanis did was that in 1963 they gave this valley, this small region uh, that, that is the Shakskam Valley to the Chinese in 1963. Now this is why this region is actually in news now because of the entire uh, build up of Chinese aggression and the way China is coming into news so many times and with the uh, recent issues that is happening in Jammu and Kashmir also. This aspect is something that is usually missed out so that is why I brought this up here. Now uh, this region is still claimed by India also. But as of now, this region is under the Chinese administration. Okay. Now, coming to the previous year question revision series. Today's question which you have to do is this. Normally, the temperature decreases with the increase in height from the earth's surface because of 1. The atmosphere can be heated upwards only from the earth's surface. 2. There is more moisture in the upper atmosphere. 3. The air is less dense in the upper atmosphere. So, find out the answer. Think about it. Find out the answer on your own and write it down in the comment section below. Now, we'll discuss the question that I had given to you yesterday. Now, here's the question. When you travel in the Himalayas, you will see the following. The first one is deep gorges. Then comes U-turn river courses. Then parallel mountain ranges. And finally, steep gradient causing landslide. Okay. So, this is a relatively easy question actually. In Himalayas, you find all of them. You do find deep gorges, which is actually very dangerous. And Himalaya, you know, is a young mountain also. So Himalaya actually has all of the above. But if there is still some confusion, there is a certain trick in which you can, uh, you know, deal with this uh, question. The first thing is, let's consider option number four. See, every young pole mountain will have very steep, uh, you know, gradients in their uh, in their rise. Actually, it will be very steep. Only if the mountain is very old, old because erosion has taken them away and it has decreased their height and slowly, slowly the, the you know, the, the gradient of the mountain becomes very low. That means it is not very steep, it is very planar in structure. 
therefore since the uh, himalayas are very steep mountains it four is definitely is there the option so like that you can eliminate option a then comes parallel mountain ranges parallel mountain ranges are always a significant you know a, a sign for most of the reason why it's a sign for young mountains and himalayas have many parallel mountain ranges the first one being the greater himalayas then the middle himalayas then the shivaliks and within these ranges also you have many dolader range karakoram range etc etc so these are all uh, you know uh, different different ranges parallel mountain ranges inside the himalayan system okay u turn rivers are also there because of the mountains it rivers because the mountain some mountains act as you know very big uh, blockade for the for the rivers to flow through a few examples for this will be the brahmaputra u turn at uh, namcha barwa now you know brahmaputra starts in china tibet it flows in china as sangpo and suddenly takes a u turn into india and that happens in the you know uh, in the easternmost section of the himalayas which mountain is called the namcha barwa it takes a sudden u turn and then it enters into india so therefore u turn is also a fairly uh, available region as to why uh, it's showing that it's a significance for young pole mountains and finally deep gorges are obviously there deep gorges are there in almost every mountain ranges so the answer for this question will be the third fourth option which is d 1 2 3 4 i hope you all got it right and i hope you enjoyed the session also if you have any doubts or queries you can write down in the comment section below thank you